This is Jeremy Tesmer with SGTV. On first Thursday in October, Sullivan Goss opened its exhibition, California Bauhaus, Influence and Adaptation. In another 10 years or so, a show like the one we have mounted will feel impossible, as so many shows of the past feel to dealers and historians today. It will simply be too difficult or expensive to gather these wonderful objects together. The story that these works of art tell is a complex one, but it all begins 100 years ago in the then new capital of Germany, in Weimar. An art school with a deadpan name, the state-owned Building House, or the Stadtliches Bauhaus, was formed to gather a group of idealistic makers, makers who dreamt of a more beautiful, more meaningful, more egalitarian world. They embodied virtually every field of creativity. Many of those teachers are still well known today. Albers, Joseph and Annie, Brewer, Feininger, Gropius, Kandinsky, Clay, Van der Rohe, Moholy Nagy, Creative and technologically sophisticated utopians, today they roost in Silicon Valley. Back then, they were huddled in the new capital of a new republic. But then the rise of the Nazi regime spelled the end for these visionaries. Most of their artwork was deemed degenerate. Many of their patrons were killed and or had their wealth stolen. And so many of them left for the U.S., These were intelligent, ambitious people whose gifts were not always enough to safeguard them from the geopolitical storms of the 20th century. But their effects in the new world are still with us today. Bauhaus ideas and aesthetics came to California in fits and starts. Kem Weber was a German-born and trained architect and designer who was assigned by his more famous boss to set up the German pavilion at the 1915 Panama Pacific International in San Francisco. Stranded here by World War I, he Americanized his name and got to work. He taught at the Santa Barbara School of the Arts, and later designed this building downtown. He also designed some of the most important streamlined modern furniture and objects in American history, culminating in his design of the airline chair for the Walt Disney Studios. Another figure in this story is Gawka Shire, a German woman who came to the U.S. in 1925, trying New York and San Francisco before settling on Los Angeles as the place to market her Blue Four. Alexei Yelensky, Lionel Feininger, Paul Clay, and Vasily Kandinsky. Shire soon found her crowd. She knew German modernist architects Richard Neutra and Rudolf Schindler, who were building modern residences throughout Southern California, She was also in touch with Arnold Schoenberg, inventor of atonal music and former musical director at the Bauhaus. Schoenberg fled Germany and wound up teaching at UCLA. To stimulate interest and perhaps sales, Shire got an important institutional exhibition organized for the forerunner of the LA County Museum of Art in 1933. Painters like Anders Aldrin were probably encouraged by an event like this. He finished his education in 1930 and had his first show there in 1935. Dan Lutz had already been teaching at USC for a few years when these events took place. His high-key colors and strong black outlines have often been cited as references to German Expressionist painting, even as his subjects were more often the kinds of regionalist images that fellow Midwestern artist Thomas Hart Benton had popularized. Gawkeshire was also friends with Walter and Louise Ehrensberg, two of the most important American collectors of modern art in the 20th century. Their circle was critical. It included artists like Elise, who had gone from dancing and doing comedy with W.C. Fields, to non-objective painting in rather short order. She went on to become one of L.A.'s first non-objective artists. Sadly, she is not so well known today, but LACMA owns over 100 of her works. Peter Krasnow from Ukraine was another artist in the Ehrensberg circle. His distinctive vision was way ahead of its time. His recent exhibition at the Laguna Art Museum had an apt subtitle, Maverick Modernist. Some of the artists in this show are more directly connected to the Bauhaus. Preeminent among these is Werner Dreves, 
whose estate we are representing here with five incredible works. Dreves studied under Johannes Itten and Paul Clay at the Bauhaus before going on an around-the-world journey, bohemian-style, with his new wife. In 1926, he made an extended stop in San Francisco. Gawka Shire was there the same year. He set up a place to sell his woodblock prints around the time that he painted these incredible small watercolors. Dreves went on to teach it through the WPA at the Brooklyn Museum at Brooklyn College when this painting was made, and later at Columbia and Washington University in St. Louis. One of Dreves' students at the Brooklyn Museum was a 17-year-old Ukrainian kid from the neighborhood named Sidney Gordon. Gordon was in a magnet school called the Brooklyn Technical High School. He went on to Cooper Union, where he made this incredible work in 1940, when the war was already going in Europe but the U.S. hadn't yet joined the fight. The Sidney Gordon estate is represented by Sullivan Goss, and I have been pleased to watch the market and appreciation for his work grow and grow. Gordon was hired to teach at UC Berkeley in 1958 after a long run of critical success in New York in the early to mid-1950s. He became known for constructivist sculpture, which made him a real outlier in the Bay Area. By 1980, he was making work like this. Black Mountain College was another important place in the history of the Bauhaus in the U.S. Annie and Joseph Albers taught there along with Emerson Wolfer. Wolfer also studied with Lazo Molinage at the new Bauhaus in Chicago. Wolfer went on to teach at Chenard and later Otis in Los Angeles. Local artist Ron Robertson, who taught at UCSB and everywhere else, also studied at Black Mountain College around that time. These teacher-mentor links also explain the inclusion of local sculptor Ken Bortolazzo, whose work with George Rickey puts him in a long lineage that extends to Bauhaus aesthetics. Angela Perko mines these old modernist styles and fills them with new ideas and themes. So other than to celebrate a centennial, why do this exhibition today? As Alfred Barr wrote in the MoMA catalog about the Bauhaus in 1938, the Bauhaus is not dead. It lives and grows through the people that made it, both teachers and students. Through their designs, their books, their methods, their principles, their philosophies of art and education. There is no Bauhaus style, only a newly liberated relationship between artists and craftspeople, between creativity and machinery, between design and modern life. We live in a world of their making, in a state known for being future-oriented. California Bauhaus will be on view through November 25th. Come see it.